Welcome to Center of Light Radio with spiritual teacher, intuitive, musician, composer, and best-selling author of The Divine Principle, Anchoring Heaven on Earth, your host, Keith Anthony Blanchard. Yes, I am Keith Anthony Blanchard, your host and captain of the Center of Light Radio's mothership on its maiden voyage. Strap in all ye spiritual astronauts as we launch for inner space. Today's program is literally just that. We will not be talking about your beliefs in aliens or UFOs. What my guest, Mr. Rex Hare, and I will discuss is beyond all of that. We will not talk about videos of UFOs that you believe are authentic or not. It is beyond all of that. We will not talk about beliefs that aliens could be living among us. It's beyond all of that. What we will do is share with you, yes, you, the truth in reality about my friend and brother, alien human hybrid heroic nucleus eight. Hold on tight and spread the light. Let it be known my declaration and promise to you, the listening audience, to provide guests and topics that open windows to your healing and expansion so that you can consciously embody your full blissful potential. Before we hit light speed, uh, let's see. Before we hit light speed, I want to give a Center of Light Radio shout out to Bob, Joe, and MJ of the Inception Radio Network team. They have welcomed me with open arms, and I thank you all greatly. Make sure to visit the Center of Light Radio's brand new website. I finished it yesterday. You can do that by going to centerofLightRadio.com. There you will find information to all my books. My bestseller, The Divine Principle, Anchoring Heaven on Earth, my children's book, Eden Sky Wonders Why, and my newest release, For the Love of God, A Spiritual Journey. This book is about my sojourn to India to experience the magic and power and divinity of a holy man that came to me in a dream. You will also find a link to my movie, Do What You Love, A Path to Passionate Living, a spiritual documentary about my life, telling you that you can live your passion and be successful. And finally, there you will also find the link to KeithAnthonyBlanchard.com where you can learn of my Do What You Love Forever course. Check it out. It's time to get down to Center of Light Radio Business. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about my friend, Mr. Nucleus 8. Some years ago, say 1998, I was going to a spiritual gathering. A friend of mine by the name of Laura came up to me and asked me, <laughs> strangely, uh, and she's a funny girl, and she was being funny that day, but there was a note of seriousness in what she was uh, asking me. She asked me, she says, Keith, do you want to meet an alien being? And I said, well, sure. Uh, she said, well, follow me. So I did just that. Wasn't sure what to expect exactly. So I followed her, and she brought me upon um, a very short statue of a woman. And when she said, hi, Keith, meet Nucleus 8, um, the being that turned around and began to speak to me uh, was, not that, <laughs> was not the woman. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the, the voice, the power, the, the boldness that came out of this little lady was truly very, very powerful, very, very masculine. And the first thing that Nucleus said to me is, what is it you want from me? <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, huh, that's a heck of a way to greet someone. And he says, I know what, let me help you. You want data. And I thought that word to be a little alien. Shortly upon after that, we became very, very good friends. And I began to spend time <clears throat> with Nucleus 8 and Rex. Lots of strange phenomena, at least from that point in my life, the, the level of conscious awareness I had then. Nucleus had the ability, and Rex will uh, vouch for this, um, while I'm lying down, conscious that is, um, grab my hand, gently begin to tug on my arm, and begin to pull me out of my body through his tug on my arm. I had the opportunity to experience a spaceship. My first thought when I entered the ship were where all the chairs. The chairs popped out of the wall. 
when I was done with the thought, the chairs went back on the wall. So as time moves forward, I be begin to have the most far out experiences with Nucleus 8. We're going to talk about a lot of that as the show continues. Let me tell you about my guest today. Dr. Rex Hare is a clinical retired psychologist who spent 40 years of his life evaluating and treating people with mental disorders. He has always believed in the existence of God, seeks to do his will, and attempts to live by the golden rule. Upon the urging of Altisha, Marjorie, the little lady I was telling you about, Marjorie's guardian angel, he kept daily notes for 15 years about their incredible experiences with interdimensional beings, which are the basis for his books. When others show interest, he enjoys discussing the many spiritual adventures he and his interdimensional family experienced. He lives in a house he built by hand with help from his earthly family and keeps his tractor and other tools in the barn he built with help from Nucleus 8. A channeling extraterrestrial, which are located on 12 acres of his beloved trees and pasture in rural northwest Tennessee. Dr. Rex Hare, welcome to Center of Light Radio. Thanks, Keith. Good to be here. Can you hear me okay? I hear you just fine, sir. Good. Thanks for the intro. <laughs> Nuke yes. thanks you too. <laughs> um, so you, you have spoken to Nucleus recently, is that, is that correct? Well, uh, I didn't speak to him directly. He contacted me on my Facebook. Ah. And you were contacted at the same time. Uh, yes. But I was, in, I was in Fayetteville over last weekend at a conference of the Ozark Research Institute, which has been dealing with uh, extraterrestrial contacts and healing and dowsing and all sorts of uh, what might be called paranormal phenomena for years and years. Uh, they're famous for their healing work and of course a lot of the conference was, was oriented in that direction. But I was having a conversation with a woman there who was having a problem of with some of her clients uh, who were being accosted at all during the night by some kind of strange being that seemed to be part human and part robotic. It looked like a human, but the, uh, the left side of its head had a metal plate where the skull should be, which made me think of right away about uh, a cyborg type being, you know, half, half robot, half human. And because of her description, uh, it occurred to me that it indeed might be representing some of the dark forces that exist out there uh, in other dimensions and in this one. Now, this, this woman's uh, clients were being kept awake all night long by this being that would say these terrible things to them, things that were would upset anyone. And on top of that, these people were empaths, extremely sensitive to feelings. Uh, empaths uh, often feel everything that happens around them as an emotion, and sometimes that goes to the extreme. So this, this, these entities were attacking them emotionally and, and psychologically, keeping them awake all night, to the point they were becoming very depressed and even considering suicide. Wow. So uh, the conversation I was having with this woman who was cons very concerned because she did not know how to eliminate these entities. She had much experience getting rid of negative entities over many years, but these were very resistant. Uh, so since I thought these might be cyborg type beings, uh, I asked her, uh, she was a, a champion dowser, by the way. Uh, uh, anyhow, we knew that Nucleus 8 was listening to our conversation because he answered the question, yes, through her pendulum. <laughs> and uh, uh, I felt when Nucleus uh, got involved, I felt his energy. It was, you know, my body was, uh, I had goosebumps and I could feel that spiritual thrill that runs up and down your spine when you encounter something out of the ordinary 
Anyhow, A was listening in on our conversation, and by asking questions and so forth, it appeared that indeed uh, members of the conspiracy that had attempted to overthrow his society, uh, who were thought to all be contained and, and disposed of one way or another, had actually succeeded in creating these cyborg type individuals because they had a system very similar to the one eight has, the one that you were uh, introduced to when you thought about a chair and suddenly one appeared. Uh, <laughs> if the system, if the dark side had a system like the Alliance's system, then it would be capable of creating these kind of cyborgs. Hmm. And every time I, I suggested something along those lines, the pendulum would go crazy saying yes. So eight, uh, this woman was also psychic and she was picking up on eight's energy and she envisioned him and she said he is really pissed now. <laughs> because <laughs> I've seen that side. <laughs> <laughs> the dark that he thought was totally contained has not been contained and it was attacking empaths on earth uh, and the woman I was with uh, through her pendulum learned that these uh, cyborg type entities intended to attack 2.5 percent of the human population on earth now it's estimated that we have about 7 billion people on earth right now that means 175 million people were going to be targeted. And what better place, if you want to create negative, powerful negative emotions, than to attack empaths? It's also estimated that I, I did some research on this just recently that approximately 2 to 4 percent of the human population are empaths. So if the dark was trying to counteract the positive effect that the center of light and, and other agencies like you who are emphasizing the importance of concentrating on our spiritual light, improving our, our spiritual uh, practices, uh, increasing our frequency of vibration, all as part of this ascension process that we hear so much about these days, then if they could create a counter force equal to the positive force, it would negate it and would definitely interfere with this whole ascension process. Does yeah. that make sense? Does that Absol make sense? Absolutely. Rex, if we could, because uh, you and I have danced this dance many times, uh, being new to Inception Radio and being new to this listening audience, let's back up a little bit and tell a little bit of the story of how Nucleus arrived in your life what his role is, and all that good stuff that people can understand that this is just not some far out kooky story. And this is something that was really, really close to home with you. <laughs> no pun intended. Literally in your house. I mean, would you tell how Nucleus made his entrance into your life and what his role is um, as an alien human hybrid? Okay. Um, my ex wife, Marjorie, uh, is an extremely gifted uh, channel and she began to channel after I started helping her with trauma that she had experienced from early childhood beginning at age four and she was one of the most traumatized people I have ever met uh, because she did she had traumas all through her life physical psychological sexual you name it it happened to her including uh, an ex-husband that tried to choke her to death and burn down her house. So she was a mess uh, psychologically when we met. And I began working with her through hypnotic regression to try and help her overcome these traumas. And uh, immediately I started receiving help from her guardian angel, Alta Shah. And it was Alta Shah who told Nucleus 8 that he should contact me. Uh, through my conversations with Nucleus 8, 
I discovered that Marjorie had been making regular journeys to his headquarters, uh, which exists in a dimension parallel to our own, 37 light years away, turn left, and you wind up in Nucleus 8's dimension. <laughs> yeah, right up. You have to go through a, a wormhole, of course, to get there. But um, he can do it instantly. He can tra His consciousness can be transferred to Earth instantly, back to the station instantly, and back to Earth instantly. Uh, it takes less than a second for him to do that. And so That's he, again, for the listening audience, uh, listening audience, this being uh, has awareness, and I don't know if it's graduated since, but six different dimensions simultaneously. Is that correct? Yes, he monitors six dimensions simultaneously. And the reason he does that and was engineered from, from birth to do that, because genetic engineering is the strong forte of the alliance to which he belongs, uh, he is the chief of security for the United Federa Federation Alliance which consists of thousands of civilizations, and those civilizations are not confined to one single dimension. When I say dimension, we live in a 3D dimension, basically, or 4D dimension, if you include time. Uh, and everything that we can see through our telescopes and everything we can measure is in the same dimension with us. Rex, if you could, I don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, it sounds like there's, if, can you be a little more still if possible? No, somehow your mic is very, very excitable. Um, if you can, it'll help. But he, you said that he, okay, has awareness of six dimensions. And would you continue from there, please? Okay. He is the chief of security, so he has to keep track of the everything that's going on in the alliance, essentially. Uh, and he has monitors uh, in front of him, like you know, like the war room of the <laughs> of the Defense Department or something. Uh, and he receives all sorts of information on these various screens. One day, uh, all of his screens went blank except for a tiny message, which said that he was to contact me. Uh, this blew his mind because it was a total violation of his security. And he couldn't understand how it could happen. Uh, <laughs> and he told me all this in our first conversation, essentially. Uh, but the, I knew because Margie's guardian angel, Altashah, had already t had told me that he was responsible for making the screens go blank and for making this message appear. So Nucleus uh, was bound and determined to contact me. I mean, this was a momentous event, and, and he thought he might even lose his position because these things are not supposed to happen under his command. Everything's supposed to keep working all the time. So the conversations with him reveal that Margie had been his star pupil since she was four years old. She was making regular visits during her sleep to the station where he is headquartered. And there she was exposed to love. She was exposed to instruction. She was exposed to uh, other extraterrestrial beings. And uh, some one of the interesting things that would happen to her when she was very young was they had a game where there might be seven or eight different species of intelligent beings in the room with her. And they had these little hat-like things that they put on and then they could experience that other person's consciousness that they were focused on as if mm. they were inside their bodies. So they felt everything that other entity felt. They knew every thought the other entity had and they could understand that entity thoroughly, you know. So this was empathy training, which would <laughs> prepare her one day for the time when she would be dealing with these in a conscious, you know, not a sleep state, but a conscious, uh, aware, everyday state. Uh, that's just an idea of the kind of technology they possess. Another, yeah. another technology that they possess is that they, they can remove a person's consciousness from his body or her body and send that consciousness to another location. 
Now, we call that out-of-body travel. Well, hang on a second there, Rex. Let me, let me interrupt you here. <laughs> 1998, I meet you, I meet Margie, I meet Nucleus. Six months, eight months into our friendship, Nucleus calls me. Hi, Keith. Um, everybody in our group, we had a group of about seven or eight people that would meet every other Sunday for meditation and whatever else and chat. Um, he calls me one day and says, Keith, uh, everybody in our group has an implant but you. I make them myself. They're smaller than your eye can see. Do you want, or do you want one? I have one left. And I said, okay, Nucleus, convince me. Convince me that I want it. Well, okay, Keith, uh, if you're lost, we can find you. If you're in trouble, we can help you. And if you're sick, we can administer medicine through the implant. And I said, okay, what are the drawbacks? And he said, well, your life is no longer private. That night, after playing seven hours of music at a casino, the last thing I want to do when I get home, the last thing on my mind is dreaming, much less of uh, an alien being that I really still, even after those experiences, wouldn't truly convict, have, have conviction that this was just as solid as possible. Well, eight o'clock in the morning, I'm awakened in a sleep state of conscious, come to consciousness and sleep state by an excruciating pain in my right kidney region, by the equivalent of a 65, 70-year-old human woman, but in alien terms, however long old she could have been, she could have been 2,500 years old, or whatever her age was. Um, and I look over my, to my right kidney region to find this lady installing this <laughs> implant, and it was so painful, I began to vomit. And she picks me up and carries me to Nucleus, who was sitting on the equivalent of what I would call a lawn chair, a pool furniture. And again, the pain was so intense, I began to vomit all over his feet. My phone in my literal bedroom rings and wakes me up out of this experience. And it's Nucleus. And he says, hey, Keith. And he's got a grin on his face. <laughs> and he's laughing. He said, Keith, uh, I just said, dude, I just had a dream about you. He said, no, Keith, you weren't dreaming. I said, man, I'm telling you, you were there. He goes, yeah, I was there. He goes, but you weren't dreaming. I said, how do you figure? He says, the vomit all over my feet says so. Now, let's fast forward. Ah, uh, gosh, 16 years into the future, 15 years into the future, since I've had any connection whatsoever with Nucleus 8, which was, Rex, on another show, you and I had a, an interview. And after that interview... I get a message after all these years on Facebook, and lo and behold, <laughs> it's Nucleus 8. How you doing, Keith? What's going on? This thing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he says, Keith, uh, you've been calling to me very loudly and very often lately. I can no longer ignore you. Of course, I wasn't doing this consciously. Uh, and he goes, I can no longer deny you. And so I'm here. He says, how about a tweak of that implant? I said, sure. We chatted back and forth here and there. Uh, he's, and I, I, one of my favorite things to do is, as you were describing, is out-of-body travel, soul travel. And uh, I said, why don't you come pick me up one night and take me someplace really, really special? He goes, Keith, I'm a really busy guy, but I'll see if I can fit something into the schedule. I, I know in him, I knew it. That night, <laughs> 5.30 in the morning, I wake up to go use the restroom for my sleep. No experience. Go back to bed. Come 9 o'clock in the morning, I, <laughs> I'm sitting up in bed coming back from his mothership planetary station from an experience of the implant being installed. I'm aboard the craft. I see all these children there, all types of children, many different races. There was even some elves there, um, one by the name of Halo, I remember distinctly. But And I remember seeing Nucleus, the um, first time I really ever got to see the guy. But I remember being escorted down this hallway, and this lady was sort of ushering me, a different lady, uh, was ushering me, and she was ushering me down this hall, and she was holding my left arm near my elbow, and I feel this pressure. So much so I'm like, ah, what are you doing? And then I looked at her before she can answer and said, you're installing that implant? Oh, she said, yes, I am. And so, so you know, he, he popped in, did his business with me, and he seemed to pop out again. So he's a very, very busy guy securing things in this quadrant of our galaxy. Right, Rex? Oh, yes. He, he's monitoring six dimensions, and he has to maintain logistics and protection for anybody who requests it. Uh, so... They keep him very busy. Uh, 
Keith, could you could you describe what what he looked like to you? You said you saw him for I the can. first time. I can. In fact, when I first came aboard the craft, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot to the experience, but some of it's just irrelevant. The first part of the uh, experience that is relevant, <clears throat> I remember walking into, <laughs> if a planetary station or a mothership has a living room, well, I was sort of like in a living room kind of setting, and uh, all these little kids are running up to me as you as you might see a missionary worker uh, in a third world country, bouncing up and down, running to you with all this kind of excitement and sort of pulling on you, and they were doing just that. And I'm familiar. I've been in this ship. I've been in this mother station many times and did not realize that until I woke up the next morning. I remember all the experiences I have with other beings. I just didn't know it was that particular group, Nucleus's group, that I've been doing this with all this time. So I, my wits come about me and I motion to have them raise your hand. I said, can you please raise up your hand? How many people have seen me on this ship before? And all of them do, except this group of about eight sitting in front. In fact, one little girl says, we all here have seen you other than uh, this group here. Um, and then for some whatever reason, I was laying on my black, back on the floor. And l looking over me, looking down on me was Nucleus. He was very slim. He was very tall. He was very white. <laughs> and I mean, he was white. Uh, I want. Um, I'd say maybe sort of like milk, but it was white. It was so white. I would say there was almost a glow, almost a glow. Of course, his black eyes. They were not as big as um, most people describe the almond shape uh, extraterrestrial eyes. But then, then again, I was looking from laying my back up towards him, and he was just leaning over me, making sure I got a. Good glimpse of him, and of course, beyond my own uh, conscious will, my head was panning um, toward the left, and I went into another experience entirely. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, did you notice the color of his hair? Rex, from my recollection, it was white. That's right. I just was checking to see if your description fit what I know to be. <laughs> well, thank you. And it does, because he is extremely pale. His hair is, is extremely white. He has black eyes, but they're not any larger in his head than a human's eyes would be, because he is a human hybrid, as you That's said. Right. That's right. And for the sake of your, your listening audience, Duke these Eight was actually born on Earth over 4,700 years ago. He lived in Egypt. Uh, and visited the Giza Plateau, where the Great Pyramids are situated, when he was a child. They were under construction. Uh, and his uncle uh, finished raising him after his parents uh, left this dimension to go to another dimension. His mother was a member of the tall gray species, who are about six feet to seven feet tall. His parents left Earth when he was about... 12 years old, and the rest of his childhood on Earth he spent with his uncle, who was a consultant regarding the building of temples and pyramids and so on and so forth all over the Middle East. So he had considerable travel when he was a young man uh, before he went was transferred to an academy, uh, which is in the dimension where he now lives. Uh, and he spent 600 Earth years in the academy receiving his training. Uh, it was extremely thorough, uh, but also was very traumatic. And it was deliberately traumatic because what he did not know, and apparently most of the people in the Alliance did not know, that the man in charge of his, his training was in cahoots with his mother, who were part of this great conspiracy I mentioned before, in secret. Uh, and they trained him so he would be extremely isolated emotionally. He would trust no one. He would constantly be 
concerned with perfection and everything he did and be I utterly... Know, Rex, I don't mean to interrupt you, but the Nucleus 8, I know, in that description of him, um, he, <laughs> he was trained in perfection. It's, it's what he is all about. That so targets him. I, I, you know, just being in his in experience with him, the time that it was, he was truly about order and perfection. Absolutely. Well, he had that all of his life because his mother trained him that way from birth. Uh, as he put it to me one time, the only contact I had with my mother was for instruction. And uh, he was always expected to be perfect in whatever he did, even before he went to the academy. The academy just made it worse. Uh, and when he met me, uh, shortly after our first conversation, he was telling me there was something about him, him that was missing. And I asked what it was, and he said it was his childhood. And now he's channeling through my ex-wife. But as you said, when he's channeling, there's no mistaking. You're talking to Nick the Estate. You're not talking to my ex-wife at all. Yeah, Rex, Rex, I will tell you this. Again, at the set of the opening of the show, uh, when Laura said, Keith, you want to meet an alien, I didn't know whether the little green man was going to jump from behind the building and say, Nanu, Nanu. Uh, whether, I, I had no idea. But when Marjorie turned around, and I hear, uh, <laughs> what do you want from me? And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> this is just not computing. There is no way that someone that short of statue can even house that kind of voice with that sort of impact. That's just, you know, look, I, I, I'll brag about myself. I can see, and I can see peripherally, and I can intuit. There was nothing being fabricated there. In fact, it hit me so hard because I wasn't expecting that. It took me back. You're right. There's absolutely no mistaking that when he's present in that body, that's for sure. Yeah, and you're not the only one who's been taken aback. I remember our mutual friend, Isabel Carr. I remember she, Isabel. When she met him, uh, she said his energy was so strong, I just got hot all over. And simultaneously, the ceiling fan began creaking and, and groaning as if <laughs> it was about to to stop working when it had been working perfectly until he started channeling. And she mentioned it and he said, sometimes I have to, to adjust my energy so it's not too strong for the person I'm talking to. And then the ceiling fan started acting okay again. So he, he brought an energy with him that many, many people have really felt, you know, and that Margie doesn't normally have. Um, so, Nucleus, when he met me, wanted to discover his childhood. And it seemed that I had been elected to help him do this. It was kind of like I had two patients now. One was Margie and the other was Nucleus 8. And uh, I didn't think of him as a patient. I just thought of him as a friend that I wanted to help. And uh, it took us quite a, several years before we, we fully dealt with all the trauma that he had gone through in his training and so on and so forth and he he shared that he had been told by extremely highly placed individuals in his society who sit at the throne of the creator that he was to blend with humans this was his task uh, and that was why he was channeling through Margie, and that was why he was talking to me, and that was why he was meeting other human friends like you and Isabel and Laura, and uh, a couple of women that he really became very attached to. Uh, unfortunately, those, those relationships didn't work out too well, but when you consider that he's channeling through a female body, and trying to establish a close relationship <laughs> with a human female, you know, from the beginning of that, I thought, how in the hell is this going to work? You know? <laughs> uh, Rex, I mean, let, me, let me ask you a question. I got a uh, pretty really good question that came in from the chat room from Neutron. Question is, did Nucleus 8 ever mention who his mother, Agree, answered to physically and to who spiritually? Do you know anything about that? Uh, well, his mother, as I said, was a tall gray, 
and she was uh, she was the leader of a bunch of of a particular clan of entities, correct? She was like a so to speak well, a queen or someone in charge. I wouldn't connect her with a, a a particular kind of entity that she was in charge of. She was very much involved in the conspiracy. It turned out that the the person who really started the conspiracy to overthrow the alliance's governing board was the was the former chief of security, the one who was chief of security before eight received the job. And it was told to me that he passed away under rather mysterious circumstances. No one really knew why he died or why he vanished when he did. His mother and this other man. Uh, were working together all along in the plan to overthrow the the uh, alliance. But she was a rare, rare, rare exception to her species because the tall greys are known to be very benevolent, very empathic, very sensitive to the feelings of others, very kind and loving. Uh, and that's why she was not suspected for so many years because her species has all the, has this reputation. Right on. Uh, and she was also definitely hiding. You know, she she was playing a role. Uh, but as far as Nuke was concerned, his mother was biological mother only. She was never a mother to him in the sense of loving him, caring about him, looking after his welfare, so on and so forth. He never had that experience. Was she capable of that? Meaning not because of her attitude, but did, do they have the ability to feel? Absolutely. To, to, to feel the human feelings, be even being a, a gray, or, or are they just intellectual beings that have the know-how of how to conduct their affairs? No. Uh, the grays, as I said, they are, their reputation is to be extremely sensitive to feelings, to be very loving, to be very uh, benevolent. And they are often used as ambassadors when a new species is encountered that no one knows exactly how to relate to because they are so empathic. They can pick up on what that other entity is feeling and thinking uh, better than uh, many other species can. Now, the, the thing that Eight once said about the greys was he said, sometimes you can walk beside, by, you know, you can just be walking beside them and you can just feel the empathy pouring from them. Wow. So, uh, but she kind of like was sort of the sociopath of her species. She had none of those traits. The only trait she did have was intellect and a desire for power. You know, like a, like a lot of the CEOs of giant corporations in this world. Mm -hmm. You know, they can play the role. They can be charming. They can be so on and, you know, have all the outward appearances they need, but underneath. Yeah, when they're on the stage, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, Rick, let's go back for just a bit. Because you and I, <laughs> we know this experience and this story so well. Um, it's, it's like we want to keep moving far down the timeline. But I do right. want to educate our listening audience for future interviews that you and I are going to do. And by the way, make sure you guys make contact with Rex. He has, Rex, correct me if I'm wrong, you have five installments of... Uh, the book about nucleus, uh, aliens, Indi Indians, fairies, and angels. Is that five installments? Is that correct? Uh, five volumes covering the 15 years of, of experiences, not only with with him, but with other channeled entities. And the, the five volumes are all under the title on Amazon. I'm sorry, not on Amazon, but on freeebooks.net. Free-ebooks.net under the title fairies angels indians and aliens and the interesting thing is is that they were all related they were all working together and so i was thinking just a little bit ago that somehow on some level <laughs> and that you marjorie and nucleus eight had some sort of agreement well obviously you couldn't have transpired otherwise but maybe before coming on to the great stage of earth that, that this was going to happen y'all pretty much needed each other for a well-rounded experience and a well-rounded healing to where the every 
think about the experience could be of benefit. When you were in your practice and Marjorie, star one, <laughs> began to visit you so you can counsel her on some of the things that were taking place with her, what was it like to put her into a space, I wouldn't say put her, but have her begin to speak to you, and it's not her. I mean, I'm sure your mind went left, your mind went right. But didn't you tell me at one point, you begin to call in some of your colleagues and say, you know, uh, it's been a long time since you and I had this conversation, Rex. So call in some of your colleagues and say, guys, what are you making of this? Uh, and they said something to the idea, you know, Rex, you're on your own with this one. What was? Can you recall that for me, please? Well... Margie had been hospitalized with suicidal impulses, but when she was hospitalized, uh, and this was not the first time it had happened to her, uh, but they called me in because she was speaking in the voice of a child. And uh, they thought she was having some kind of psychotic episode or what we call a dissociative episode in which her consciousness has flipped in some you know, she's doing something else uh, entirely, like uh, multiple personality disorder or regression to a, a childhood state of mind. But when I talked to her, uh, I recognized right away that this was not multiple personality and it was not regression. It was a definite entity speaking to me through her. And that was my first introduction to a fairy. Now, the fairy's name, we learned later on, was Perithia. Yeah. And she I've had the told pleasure us, of meeting her. <laughs> she, she told us that she was a fairy, but we didn't know that until maybe a month or two after we had first made our acquaintance. But all the entities that are mentioned in the book that I write about, that, in which I've written many, many of our hypnotic sessions, uh... All those who worked with me were benevolent. They were kind. They were loving. They, you know, one thing I learned through my experiences with over 15 different entities that, that, that would channel through Margie on a regular basis was that love is universal. And uh, every species understands what love is, is capable of experiencing love, and capable of expressing love except for those rare exceptions of those who who don't have that capacity, you know. Mm. Uh, there are some species who tend to be more warlike, for example. There are some species who tend to value uh, conquest and who value uh, being able to get something for nothing. Uh, but that's just their culture. It's not, it's not that they are individually... Uh, like that with everyone, particularly their own kind. Uh, the thing about the alliance uh, is that it is uh, entirely voluntary. The alliance never asks, never tries to force anyone to join it. Uh, and they have requested on more than one occasion of the Earth's major leaders, do you want to join the alliance? And every time they have asked this question, and they've done it about three different times in the last 50 years, the major leaders of this world have said no. Because in order to join, you have to accept the principles of the alliance. Those, <laughs> yeah. And those principles are, uh, you do not maintain weapons of mass destruction, although you can have representatives in the uh armed forces of the alliance everyone who is a member of the alliance can send their recruits to be trained to become soldiers for the alliance but their military unlike our own is entirely defensive they never attack unless it is in self-defense that's very very awesome to me man uh, and i'm sure their arsenal their military might is just <laughs> Uh, heavy and amazing, but I, I love the idea, you know, that they're totally on the de de defensive posture um, to where they literally have no choice but that that final step before there would be ever any engagement. Yes, uh, 
their their whole thing is the preservation of life and the creation of life and uh, they are creators because they are masters of genetic manipulation you know humans are becoming creators too we have created several new species since we learned how to clone uh, genetic material uh, from one species to another a lot of the food we eat these days actually is is a totally new organism it's not the same lettuce that we used to eat it's something different uh, but these guys can can take uh, genetic material from a variety of species to create an entirely new species and they do that on occasion because they have discovered a planet for example that can support life it is the right distance from its star or multiple stars whatever the case may be and uh, if it's capable of supporting life frequently they will terraform that planet and create a, a living ecosystem uh, that can spread throughout the entire planet once they start a planet up like that they let it let evolution take its course they don't interfere unless it becomes absolutely necessary uh, for protection of species or that sort of thing uh, so they are in a sense like creator gods when you can take an entire planet and take it from a, a non-living mass and and make it into a, a wonderland of species I mean that's pretty close to the definition I would say Rex, let's go back, say, 1999. <laughs> I remember visiting you <clears throat> at your place in Martin, Tennessee. Myself, Laura, Marjorie. It was Marjorie at the time. Yes. Not Nucleus. And Wendy, my then-girlfriend. Uh-huh. We decide about 11 o'clock, we're just going to take a little stroll down this dirt road. It's a pasture on one side, some woods ahead of us, and we're far enough away uh, from where you lived to where there was no light pollution. I, I, and I, I'm not sure if there was a street light there, but I knew we were quite a distance away and there was no light pollution. And as we we're all just walking and talking, now again, it was Marjorie. <laughs> Mid-sentence, Nucleus decides he's going to show up and pop in. <clears throat> Excuse me. And out of nowhere, he says, Hey, Keith, Wendy, have you guys ever seen a fairy before? Man, out of all the things that have happened to me, being around Nucleus, I knew that something somehow different <laughs> was going to transpire. And my then girlfriend, Wendy, looks at me and whispers, is this for real, Keith? I said, I think we're about to see a fairy. He says, 60 feet down on the road, sitting on a plant leaf, we'll, we'll find my fairy friend by the name of Perithnia. 11 o'clock at night, we're walking down the road along the, uh, the fence that divided the road from the cow pasture, uh, he pulls up a plant leaf, and I kid you not, there's a globule of light the size of your thumb, about the size of a marble, sitting there just glowing like you might expect a conscious ball to do when it's communicating. And he begins to <laughs> have a dialogue with Perithnia. Um, lasted about a minute or so, and he says uh, she wants us to follow her. And I kid you not, this ball of light got off of this plant leaf. It begins to bounce down the road like you might see in a Disney movie. Um, and he said, oh, oh, she's got to go and she took off across the, the, cow, the cow field. But I do remember another experience. You, myself, Marie, Laura, Marjorie, and a few others, we were at a Chinese restaurant sitting at this big round table. Um, and again, Marjorie was present, and all of a sudden, Nucleus pops in, hello, group, <laughs> as he was famous for doing. And as I began a dialogue with him, you know, hello, Nucleus, good to see you, what's been going on? Uh, out of nowhere, he says, uh, hey, Keith, you remember, uh, I've been telling you that I'm, I can hook you up with an invisible friend, you know, someone to talk to you, put some pretty cool ideas in your head, and someone to play with you and watch over. He said, absolutely, he says, push your chair back. So I scoot my chair back. He says, Keith, push your chair back. I'm about to sit someone in your lap. And no sooner than I do, someone begins to sit on me and I can feel the pressure. And my ears begin to ring so much so the volume of it was almost painful. And of course, Wendy's hand goes up and said, oh, Nucleus, can I have a friend too? He says, push your chair back. <laughs> she pushes a chair back and she turned her head and looked to me. She almost broke her neck. 
the look on her face was just amazing that, you know, I'm somewhat further along the path and can somewhat be ready for such experience to happen. She had no idea um, what was coming. Have you, I've actually had the experience, Rex, one day when I was at your place <clears throat> to have Perithne begin to work through me. It lasted a very, very short time. All these beings that you had the opportunity to experience, how often were the other entities like Altisha and Perithne and the other group? Was it predominantly nucleus the whole time? No, it wasn't, uh, especially in the beginning. Uh, in the beginning, he might make an appearance uh, once or twice a week. Uh, but as time went by... It became daily. Uh, there were various reasons for that, but partly because he just valued our company so much. It was such a break for him to be away from the station and all the demands of his work. It was like a vacation to come and visit Earth and be with us, who had loved him, and he appreciated that greatly because he had never had that before. And you know, I can from my time with him. I could see exactly that. I can. That's another validating point for me, because earlier you were talking about his. We we're talking about his order, his perfection. Uh -huh. he, he he had a disposition and an innate ability. When I the order and the perfection I saw in him wasn't an obsessive compulsion. It was truly who he was. There was no T uncrossed. There was no I that was not dotted. You can bet on that. Hence the reason he's number eight on the board of 12, head of security in this quadrant of our galaxy. But I can see that when he was here with us, you, Marjorie, that there was this big sigh of relief from leaving the station and having a small holiday or vacation. But also I could see within him the knowing that this vacation was going to come to an end and he would have to get back to the grind. I can actually see that, and that's another part of spending time with him that validated me the truth and the reality of Nucleus 8. Yeah, uh, he started discovering his buried emotions after being with us for a time. And after the, he and I had actual sessions in which he would enter a trance and revisit some of his childhood experiences. Wow. And, and his emotions were coming to the surface, and he was not prepared to deal with them at all. Uh, they had been totally suppressed by his training, which, by the way, was not typical. His training was specially designed to make him the way he was, which was not typical of the training that other ETs were receiving. They wanted him to be like that, perfectionistic, isolated, uh, and obedient uh, so that he could carry out a role that they wanted him to play when the SHIT hit the fan. Uh, and he would have done it if he had not been awakened. That's why the, the patrons, as he called them, told him to blend with humans. They wanted him to get in touch with his emotional side. They wanted him to, to learn about his human side because they knew it would be essential to, over, to overcoming the, the conspiracy. Let me ask you this, Rex, without violating uh, patient-doctor confidentiality. Because he was, well, yeah, half human, half hybrid. When he began to delve into his emotions, when he, he would express himself through Marjorie, as you said, he was not ready uh, to deal with such density uh, emotionally. Was there any... Signs of expression that was just different, not just the outcrying or the anger or whatever the emotion may be. Did something seem different in his emotional outbursts, if there was any at all, that would set him apart from someone else being human that might be on your table? Uh, only in the sense that, that uh, because he has such tremendous energy. You know, he has two brain stems. He is vibrating at a much higher rate than humans vibrate at on Earth. Uh, when his emotions were affecting him in his dimension, they could actually be destructive. Uh, uh, if he got angry, uh, he would things would start 
being destroyed around him. Uh, so that was different. The intensity, the power of his emotions. You mean tele tele uh, telekinetically things would begin to happen, or he would just get angry and begin to break he would, things? He would go to his quarters, and he would, when he was enraged by what had been done to him, he would go to his quarters, and he would uh, deliberately uh, break things with his mind. Hmm. You know, Kind of like we might go and hit a punching bag. He was just destroying things. Uh, and he didn't want anyone to know that he had lost his composure because, God, how can he be chief of security? For six You're right. Absolutely. Years? Absolutely. So he was trying to hide all these emotions, but he wasn't being very successful with it. And the board finally told him to come to our house and stick take a sabbatical we don't want you coming back here until you're until you're stable again fortunately at that time uh, another fairy who had emulated nuke loved nuke spent all the time he could spend at the station this fairy's name was adam by the way i remember that uh, Adam had been raised by us, essentially, but he, he matured very quickly and became what we would consider an adult intellectually very, you know, in a short period of time. And so he, he, he loved Nucleus 8 and he wanted to be like Nucleus 8. In fact, he told Nucleus 8 he would like to have his job. So Adam was prepared to take over, but 8 also had another second in command at that time, who was... Uh, his trusted companion for many, many centuries. So there was plenty of backup when he was incapacitated. And he came and stayed with us. In fact, he said, "Can you? would you mind if I spend a year at your house? What was the name? If you can uh, reveal that. What name are you referring the, the, to? His backup, his second in command. His second in command, that person's name was Nocor, N-O-C-O-R. Okay, okay. Uh... So, uh, lots and lots of things happened over the years, but for a while, Nucleus 8 was our, was our baby in a sense. And we, here, he could regress to childhood and he could experience all those emotions that he was never allowed to experience as a child. And uh, uh, Margie's channeling him almost continuously, and uh, he's... He's crying for days at a time, practically. And uh, when he finally got it out of his system, he said, I have cried uh, a thousand years worth of tears. So he was very human in that sense. And uh, when, he wasn't, when he wasn't greatly saddened by the things that had happened to him, he, then he would be very angry about what had been done to him. And that's normal, too. But it, that all led to the discovery of the conspiracy. And so it was all part of a plan, like you said in the beginning. It, you know, my background uh, from childhood had been a strong interest in the notion of traveling to other planets, meeting other species. I read a lot of science fiction. I was very uh, interested in the reports we were getting back in the 50s. You know, I was about 10 years old in 1951, and through the early 50s, there were several people who were having uh, contact experiences and who were channeling aliens and receiving all these messages, like people like George Adamski and uh, George Van Tassel and Eric Lustbotter and Baird Wallace and Howard Minger, Donald Fry, these people were in the news, uh, and they had followings, and they wrote books, and some of them are still available today, uh, about their contacts with ETs who were very benevolent and who had all were saying the same things to all these guys. The message was always the same. It looks like your wish came true. <laughs> exactly. You know? In a big way. And I never expected that to happen. You know, when when this first began, I was already 50 years old. You know, I'm 73 now, and I was like 53 back back then. 54. Well, that's nothing compared to Nucleus's age. You know, back when I came to Friend Hill, he was 
4,720, and that was 17 years ago. So um, I remember the story, Rex, and fill in the gaps if you can, that their technology is such that provided you don't get decapitated or blown apart, um, if you die of certain causes, they can rejuvenate you half of your life. And then if you die again, they can rejuvenate you half of that time. And third time, your biological body is spent. Is that correct, sir? Do I remember that right? It's been so many years. Well, you don't have to die first. What they what they do is um, when you're reaching a, a point at which your body is beginning to deteriorate from old age, then you will be given that option. Do you want to be rejuvenated? And if you do, then, like you say, they can give you about half of your normal lifetime back to you. So eight's normal lifetime is around 8,000 years. If he, Earth years. If he is rejuvenated, he could live to 12,000 years. If he is rejuvenated then, he could live another six years. So, I mean, 6,000 years. So potentially he could live about 20,000 years. It gives a whole new definition to Methuselah. <laughs> yeah, in their definition, <laughs> in, their, in their dimension, you know, time is a very different thing than it is in our dimension. Uh, so things are happening at a rate six times faster in his dimension than they're happening in our dimension. And uh, uh, he would say, coming to Earth, I have to really lower the frequency of my vibrations. And, and uh, it's like walking through molasses. <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't miss it altogether if he did. <laughs> he probably, I mean, he probably obviously couldn't mingle with our energies if he didn't because of the density here, I'm sure. Well, when he would channel through Marjorie, he did have to uh, lower his frequency of spiritual vibration. Sometimes he would bring his body with him, but it would be invisible because it is vibrating at such a higher frequency. He didn't do it very often because... His physical body is highly radioactive. And, I'd imagine uh, so. It would be dangerous for him to spend much time around a human being in his physical form because of radiation poisoning. And this was deliberately done to him when he was in the military academy. It was not a normal feature of his body. And... Uh, he had never really thought about it, but the more I heard about this radioactivity of his body, I said, well, how can the grays be around you if you're so highly radioactive? And uh, it made him start thinking about it. The grays are more tolerant of his radioactivity uh, than humans. But what had been done with him at the academy to make him highly radioactive, which I think was done so that he would have difficulty interacting with human beings. They kind of they have presentient uh, pre ab ability. Sometimes they can see into the future and, and figure out what's going to happen four thousand years from now. You know, mm, right? So, so he they did not want him to be able to mingle in his physical form with humans because he would be too radioactive for them to tolerate it. <laughs> Uh, so they made him radioactive by gradually introducing uh, greater and greater amounts of radioactive isotopes into his body uh, until his tolerance, his personal physical tolerance for radioactivity became very high. But it also helped to isolate him, you know, which is the key thing they wanted to do, keep him isolated. Right. Uh, but... The, the thing about Nucleus A was that uh, he took all aspects of his job extremely serious and, and, the, and the part about protecting, protecting members of the alliance, protecting his military force, protecting anybody who was being attacked by someone uh, outside the alliance. Rex, we are we're coming up to the the top of the uh, the end of the show here. I would absolutely love and invite you back for a part two heroic nucleus H show. I just think that would be awesome. We can take up from where we uh, left off. Is there a final thought? First, I want to say thank you for 
um, the Center of Light Radio's main voyage joining me here. It means a lot to me. I, I'm absolutely convinced in the, the reality in my experience with Nucleus 8. Uh, is there any final thought you would like to leave our listening audience with here? I'd like to quote uh, a channeled message uh, that was given to Baird Wallace in 1972 by an entity named Lutu, Latu, L-A-T-U, who is an extraterrestrial. He said, but I wonder, my friends, if you realize that each time you fail to extend your love, to project a kind thought, to do a good deed, I wonder if you realize that you have let an opportunity go by to serve your creator and your fellow man. This is really your purpose, service to your creator and to your fellow man. Each time that you let this opportunity go by, it is just that much longer, shall we say, that it takes you to grow and to realize you're at oneness with your creator and your fellow man. Nucleus 8 would endorse that 100%. <laughs> yes, he would. Rex, again, my brother, my friend, thank you for joining me here on the launching of Center of Light Radio. You are a blessing in my life. Uh, you are too, Keith. Thank you very much. Take care, my friend. Everyone, your host, the Center of Light Radio. My name is Keith Anthony Blanchard. I do appreciate you being here. Please uh, share this show with your friends. As I said at the beginning of the show, you can bet I'm going to be bringing on guests with topics that are all are about your healing, if need be. But most importantly, your expansion into becoming all that you are, becoming the embodiments of your full potential. Again, you can go to centeroflightradio.com, brand new site full of uh, lots of powerful, exciting things. Um, also, I want to give you a shout out to uh, Dr. Nikki Elliott for my next week's show. You're going to have to be here for this show. I, I, she is truly amazing. The show is going to be titled as of now. Uh, it's all about the children. She's an intuitive. She does phenomenal. I cannot say enough about what this lady is able to do in her gift. Work with troubled children. It uh, doesn't matter to what degree of trouble your child may have, even She's done her work on my child, and the next day, my son's life changed. Uh, Dr. Nikki Elliott's going to be here, so make sure you join uh, the Center of Light Radio for that show. Once again, y'all, I do appreciate you. I want to give another shout-out to the Inception Radio Network team, Joe, MJ, and Bob, for welcoming me. I bid you all a wonderful evening, peace, love, and light, and always remember, always remember, always remember to take that breath. <sighs> Who you truly are lies just behind that. Easy to believe.